Swinburne University of Technology. Howdy, howdy, everybody. Craig again. It's the sociology of politics this week, week nine. Um, let you in on the secret. It's actually not week nine. It's the Thursday before this starts. Um, the Thursday before the Monday when you started. Um, so I, I mentioned that because it's it's in a few minutes the Prime Minister is going to have a press conference to tell us that she's going to have a fight with an official formal fight with Kevin Rudd. So uh, it's quite timely that we're doing politics. Now the politics that we're uh, we're going to talk about today in the context of your your textbook looks at at, at global politics and and the the sort of the the political setting um, uh, for sort of the the Western world and um, the the major organising principles that um, that then flow down to the various political political systems um, and there are two things two two things. Uh, well, no. Calm down. <laughs> There's one thing, one concept that that's key here, and that's power. The two aspects of power, which is what I was referring to, um, are um, are its manifestation in politics. But I, I, I suppose I should remind. Well, not remind you because I haven't spoken about it before. Really, it's been implicit in everything that I've been talking about. In sociology, when we're using the sociological imagination, when we're trying to get sort of in, around, under, on top of, through, and between issues to to fully understand what's going on in the social world, one of the key things that we're looking for is power. We're looking for the source, the root, the, the explanation, the exercise of power. And power, and, and I talk about it, I'm pointing over to the lecture thing that you'll be reading, um, power is, is normally, power's mentioned in the first paragraph. Um, is what I was going to say. Power is normally seen as hierarchical. The, the, the bigger and uglier and richer and all of that you are, the higher up the totem pole you are, the more power you have and you can exert that and run that down to the bottom where the e.g. minciest, uh, wimpiest, poorest, however you like to categorise people who don't have power are subject to power. This is the the the, the the essentialized understanding of power there. Now that's not that's not that's not totally true. And Foucault, Michel Foucault, a French he was a historian, he was a post uh, modernist or he 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 was categorized in that philosophical movement of post modernity. Um, he's he's died um, a while ago now. Um, Foucault talked about power and Foucault talked about the ubiquity of power, that the power is everywhere, but power is not the hierarchical. Power extends out in all directions. Power is a th three dimensional thing and we all have power that we can exert up, out, in, through, down, in all directions. Power isn't, isn't simply a sort of a binary um, measure between those who have it and those who don't and then there are the relative expressions of it between those two polarities. Um, power is something that, that we all have to a certain extent. I, it's early in the morning, I've just come from home, I have power over my cats. So when I'm eating toast this morning and they're standing on the table going, give me some of that, I can, no. Power is something that we all exert and use. Now, it's obvious that that Rupert Murdoch or the bloke in Syria who's running that dreadful show at the moment do have enormous amounts of power that can be expressed through various uh, I didn't turn off my phone. David's saying you didn't turn off your phone and he's right because that was a message for me. Oh, it's a nice message too, but I'll turn off the phone and I won't read it. Well, I just know who it's from. Um, uh, so, 
Power then can be mobilised in various ways. So Murdoch can use uh, his papers and his journalists to exert influence through the power of the um, um, the circulation of, of his papers and, and through his various uh, television outlets. Um, what's the bloke in Syria's name? Um, um, no, he's dead. Oh, uh, anyway, <laughs> Gaddafi, David was mentioning, but uh, along similar lines, we can use Gaddafi. He then had people and military equipment that he could mobilise in order to give expression to, to, to his power. So too in politics, there's um, in, in, in relatively um, sort of clean, prosaic politics that, that we have uh, in Australia, um, understanding understanding how powers well understanding power in a broader sense first i suppose is is uh important and then moving to see how how that power is expressed in in political terms is the um is the key the key issue that we'll we'll come to terms with shortly now from a sociological point of view um We'll, we'll, we can go back to Max Weber, who I've talked about a, a, a few times, who was uh, a reasonably progressive um, theoretician um, and one of the, the founding fathers, again, of sociology. Um, Weber argued that there were three, essentially three forms of power that were expressed in, in modern society. Um, maybe not postmodern society, as Foucault was suggesting, where um, uh, he'd say power is fractured and it's expressed in, in lots of different ways. Now, these, in, a lot of the things I've talked about and I've indicated to you um, uh, may be contradictory but run parallel uh, at the same time so that you can have that conservative um, functionalist Durkheimian view of the world where we're trying to constrain expressions that go beyond the, the sort of the the core norms and values of a society to the conflict world that, that Marx talks about where you're going in and confronting issues and pushing boundaries and trying to get things to change trying to break open that that functionalist world um, so to empower we can we when I explain what the Weberian uh, conceptualization of power is you'll be able to see how that works still today um, but also um, I think you'll understand that there's just something happening at the door but it looks like somebody's left something outside my door I think there are flowers outside my we will see I'll let you know um, you'll see the 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 Foucault's form of power no, someone's just picked it up and taken it away. They've stolen my flowers. Um, we'll see that uh, Foucault's form of power will, can, can be understood, that, that, that it's not simply a matter of top-down anymore, or maybe never was. And even if you think of family dynamics and how power works in families, it's not sort of anymore the sort of the patriarchal father father at the head, mother sort of underneath and, and the kids below. It, it works in, in a much more complex way. Um, but also the Weberian way um, I think is still descriptive of, of how, how power works and particularly in the big, the big sort of bureaucratic institutional world which, which Weber dealt with uh, quite effectively. And that, remember I was talking about Weber theorising about bureaucracy and ultimately ending up in the iron cage. So Weber's three conceptualizations of power. <laughs> I've made you hang out for this one, haven't I? And it's not that interesting. <laughs> Kidding. Um, well, maybe I'm not. Um, Weber's can three conceptualizations of power. There is traditional power, there is rational legal power, and there is charismatic power. Now these are given expression through uh, organize, organizing around these these notions. Now, the notion of traditional power um, is given expression through um, the organizations that are built around uh, a set of fundamental values that have been consistent over a long period of time. Now, um, and to a certain extent, uh, the 
traditional power passes from from one person to the next and it's the gift of the person who has the power to the next person so um, in terms of monarchy so um, is monarchy is a form of traditional power because you're not going to shatter the line of of monarchical power so um, Queen Elizabeth will pass it on to Prince Charles who will pass it on to to William who will pass it on to his now did they change it or was it the Danish who changed it so that a woman could a girl could take power anyway there yeah, I think it was the Danish David saying Danish yeah yeah <laughs> and he's thinking of the food um, so wills whoever w whatever sex of child William and Kate produce that will pass on as well that root that source of of power that is passed on from generation to generation is is what you would categorize as traditional power um, power in the church um, uh, the the powers that that are asserted through the popes and and through the the archbishops and the bishops um, is also a form of traditional power because it's um, it's constrained and contained within a, a, a very strict set of rules um, that can be traced back through history so that that's that form of power even even in in everyday life um, if you say think of of a family business um, that that form of power say within the organization that is based on the ownership by the family you may have employees from outside the family but the authority the traditional authority comes from the family and remains with the family so it's it in an organization that's so sort of strictly and rigorously fam family owned it's very hard to rise up through the ranks and become the boss in in that sort of institution because the power is traditionalized and the authority is traditionalized and it remains around the family despite if you like the merit of those who are in the organization just underneath that um, if, again if you think of Ru Rupert Murdoch uh, despite the fact that it's a public company owned by by thousands of shareholders if you like the family the Murdoch family still own uh, in inverted commas own the the power of the organization and can exert power and authority in that organization and stop people rising up beyond their level to to take take over they I mean, Murdoch has the benefit of you know, um, shake yeah, I'm not going to remember him either. Shake your booty. Let's. Um, there's a there's a, a, a Middle Eastern sheikh who owns a large block of shares who who is always going to support or up till now has always supported Murdoch, which has kept his traditional power safe. And it's interesting that that you would argue that that then the sheikh who's coming from a, a sort of a traditional uh, family dynasty circumstances also supporting another family dynasty. So that form of traditional power you can still see given expression in in modern society um, the second form of power rational legal power um, is that which is mo closest to to Weber's conceptualization of, of bureaucracy and therefore um, is is sort of reasonably straightforward to understand its rational legal power is 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 power which is sourced um, not from history not from tradition not from the position of 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 your family or or from um, the historical record but from legislation rules and um, to a certain extent conventions particularly in politics because in Australia we run our politics to a certain extent on conventions as well but those conventions are yes they're traditional in in the sense that um, they've been passed down but they're implicitly rational legal because um, if you do test a convention um, um, say freedom of speech um, there's a convention that we have freedom of speech in Australia it's not written into the Constitution at all we have no right to free speech in the Australian Constitution but when you take it to the High Court as, as, as has happened on, on uh, a few occasions and I think Theophanus or Theophanus depending on what school you went to um, 
the Theophanes judgment was the first judgment that established an implicit right to free speech, which judges, the High Court judges, found, in inverted commas, um, found in the Constitution. So despite the fact that it has a traditional link, it's still expressed in a rational legal way. So the power that comes to people from, from the rational legal world is, is just that. It's either, either legally constituted power, so a policeman or policewoman has power over you to stop you when you're driving the car, whether you're being a rat bag or not, uh, and has the, the, the right to impose a fine on you because they've been given that power. They have a gun that they can pull out and use because they've been given that, that, that power and authority through the rational, well, through the legal system. The, the notion of rational authority um, comes out of the modernity and the enlightenment where we acknowledge that, that, that science, the force of the better argument, um, gives you authority, um, being irrational, being, being flippant, being um, silly um, about things is not going to give you much power or authority, but if you're, if you're rational, um, tempered, well argued, well researched uh, and critical in your representations in most aspects of of world, well no, not most aspects, in those aspects of worldly life where there is a contest of power, um, that rational approach is also going to give you power and authority as well. The third form of power is charismatic power and that's, um, that's probably the most interesting one of, of the three powers, the three, well Weber calls them, I, sh I should say, should correct that, Weber calls them authorities and you'll see um, in the, um, in the lecture notes that, that I refer to as authority. So these are the authorities that give you power, if you like. Not if you like, that's the fact. Um, so charismatic authority, he says leaning back, trying to look as charismatic as possible. Um, charismatic authority is that, that power which flows to somebody through force of their personality, uh, through force of their, uh, their rhetorical skills, um, their, maybe to a certain extent their intellect, but you can be smart and dull, you can be, be smart and not charismatic, but the combination, and, and if you look at the politicians that, that we've had who've been smart, um, and we'll call the measure of smartness whether you've been a, um, a Rhodes Scholar and gone to Oxford, so Bob Hawke, Rhodes Scholar, went to Oxford. Kim Beasley, Rhodes Scholar, went to Oxford. Tony Abbott, Rhodes Scholar, went to Oxford. Now, I reckon there's only one who you'd describe as charismatic. David? Yeah, would no. Tony Abbott, is that? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, Bob Hawke, you'd have to say, was charismatic. Um, now, of all of those three, I think you'd say Beasley presented as sort of the most learned and intellectual, if you like. Some may say a bit sort of, no, no, that'd be unfair to say a bit sort of duffery, but I, I think Beasley presented himself as reasonably thoughtful. Well, let's set Tony Abbott aside. Um, um, because I don't, I, Oh, well, I, say, I suppose I should say, I think Tony, Tony Abbott is so much a political product that it's really hard to see through um, what is a, 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 a political representation of the self rather than the real self. Well, maybe one of the ways to do it is he's written a, a, a book re relatively recently that's, that's very insightful and thoughtful and rational and intelligent um, about, about modern conservative politics. Uh, he doesn't allow that side out and so it's interesting to contemplate um, the role, the perception of the role of, of the, the, the intellectual in political life and it, it seems if and then I'll bring Hawke in there because one of the reasons why Hawke was charismatic was he really didn't demonstrate that 
uh, that intellectual aspect. He was smart, he was sharp, he knew how to deal with people, but he wasn't overly intellectual despite the fact that we knew he was intellectual. What we do with a charismatic person, say like, like Hawke, we read into them because they have this charisma, because they draw people to them, because they have something about them, we, we read other things into them. So we read, we probably read into Hawke more intellectuality than we were actually given evidence for. Not, I'm not suggesting that he wasn't, he obviously was, is, is an extremely bright man, but, but his, the, the key to his popular success was, was, he, well, was his ability to negotiate. Um, uh, he did a series of boy lectures way back in the 80s talking about, um, essentially about pragmatism, but, but, but about being, being, being able to negotiate your way through, through to, to, to a settlement. Um, so it wasn't force of intellect, it was, it, was, it was human interpersonal negotiation skills and then the charm, apparently he was very charming as far as women were concerned. Yeah, no, I don't quite get it either. Um, and you know, blokes loved him. Yeah, well, no, they did. Come on, they did. You know, any, any boss who's going to sack a worker for being late today is a mug or a bum. A bum. A bum. This was the, when we won the Australia's Cup. Um, and that was very Bob <laughs> for, for impersonation. Um, so anyway, my point is here that charismatic authority is, is rested in the individual. And so in terms of seeing we're talking about politics, in terms of politics, you can, um, y you'll be able to identify those who are charismatic. Um, um, I've got to use John Howard again because I just love it. Um, John Howard was obviously not charismatic, but had an enormous amount of authority. Um, and that authority grew because, um, and that authority grew uh, probably through the rational legal uh, expression of that because because Howard was considered pretty dopey and and sort of ineffectual and and through the the process particularly of his prime ministership his authority grew but I don't think it grew out of out of charisma it, it grew out of out of respect for for how he sort of he, he turned himself around and dealt with the the political day-to-day -day stuff and, and and so that was that was that was more to do with management um, um, personality management management of the self than it was about about charisma how it had to bring stuff to him the charismatic politician pushes stuff out and then people are drawn to them so um, Bill Clinton was is always suggested to be another charismatic politician um, You'd probably say Obama was 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 charismatic. He's struggling at the moment, it seems. But but there was there was a charisma that may have been built around um, his the uniqueness of, of his his position being the first black president. Um, so you know then charisma isn't a thing that you can say well time will tell what the legacy is you you really don't ever leave a legacy of of uh, charismatic leadership uh, i don't think and particularly not in the weber conceptualization because the key thing that weber argues in terms of char charismatic authority is that it it drains away bleeds away when the charismatic politician or the charismatic leader leaves so institutions uh, governments in particular um, have a problem once the charismatic leader leaves the government tends to to fall apart and that's why it's it's hard for uh, new leaders to follow charismatic leaders um, so Keating following Hawke only lasted one um, one election cycle. He had one term of government as Prime Minister. Um, I don't know whether you describe Keating as charismatic, but he was certainly powerful, had a lot of authority, he was very entertaining, he was obviously bright, um, but he did polarise people, whereas the, the charismatic leader tends not to polarise, um, and m people tend to like the charismatic leader. Some people eulogise the charismatic leader, but it's hard to 
to dislike the charismatic leader. I mean, if you're ideologically opposed in political terms, you're not going to like anybody. But um, um, it was interesting a couple of weeks ago on Q&A, which is on the ABC Monday nights at, at 9.30, um, they have a panel of, of people from politics and the media and, and public life um, spread across the political spectrum and they were all asking them, and I might have mentioned this earlier, I don't know, can you remember David? No. Anyway, they asked who they thought was the, the, the most effective Prime Minister in the last, you know, 20, 30 years, and all of them from both sides came up with Keating. None of them came up with Hawke because they weren't measuring charisma, they were measuring effectiveness um, and they were, they were um, uh, probably measuring the sort of, the, in political terms, the brutal effect because to a certain extent there is a, a, a brutalising aspect about politics um, where if you can either rise above it, and few do, um, or engage in it, um, you're seen as a winner and Keating always came through Oh, and generally does come through because of of of, of his sort of brute force and um, sort of depth of policy knowledge and vision. Um, the charismatic leader um, is seen uh, for for his or her personality uh, rather than for for their um, um, all of those those factors that I talked about, Keating, um, but. Getting back to the point I was making, the 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 institutions that that are built around the charismatic leader tend to fall apart when the leader leaves. So Keating only got one term, um, and by the end of it, people hated him. They, they, I think, they used to say they were ready. What did they say? They were ready with. I don't know. Anyway, things to hit him with when the election came around. What did they say? There was baseball bats. Baseball bats. The electorate was there ready with baseball bats when the election came. And they were going to give him a good whacking and did. Um, I don't know what we make of what's going on just at the moment between Gillard and, and Rudd, but you'd have to say on the response of the electorate that Rudd had a certain charisma that, that Gillard just doesn't. And so that, that Rudd Despite the fact that, um, uh, despite the fact that that uh, he was dumped and and the members of the party didn't like him, the public did, for inexplicable reasons. Because I, I don't find him particularly charismatic, but but there was something about the population that that seems to have identified him that way. Whereas they haven't with Gillard, which which is they're sort of interesting. So they're the three conceptualizations of power that. Um, uh, or, or authority um, that we base our understanding about a lot of about institutions, organisations, and and politics um, in sociology, and that's that's built on Weber's uh, Weber's conceptualisation. So we've had the um, the Weber notion and the the Foucault notion working sort of in in parallel. Now there are there are four major categories of political organisation that you need to know about. Um, that's uh, and again in your notes the totalitarianism, authoritarianism, monarchy, and democracy. Now, the um, the the totalitarian state. Um, and you'd have to say what's going on in Syria at the moment is an expression of totalitarianism, is a state that's run um, by a hierarchical institution um, and a very powerful institution that is pe that's prepared to mobilise the forces of um, the government and society um, to any extent in order to maintain their power. Um, usually based on, usually based on some ideology. Well, has been based on an ideology because the the two major communist regimes in the, of the 20th century, the USSR and China, were certainly based on on what they called a Marxist ideology, what I I'd call sort of a totalitarian ideology that used Marxism as a political expression, and. So the point I'm making is that, that a totalitarian regime, in order to maintain its power and its authority, um, will do that 
at, at pain of death and the pain of death um, is usually that of the people although as David was mention, mentioning earlier Gaddafi ultimately paid the, uh, the price as well along with a whole bunch of bunch of citizens so a totalitarian regime works on the basis that, that they, are, they have complete power this is where the notion of total totalitarianism comes in and that power will be given expression up to and including the requirement for the death of those who who resist that power now contrasting that with authoritarianism um, um, the authoritarian state um, It's sort of the next level down, if you like. So they're 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 a hardline organisation. They're not namby pamby. Um, so if we've if we've co some comparing the etymology, you've you've got the notion of total, and now you've got the notion of of authority. And so, um, and we probably it's probably good for you to orientate your thinking about these in, in relation to democracy where where we assume that we have the power, we the people have the power, um, so authority resides with us. So the authoritarian regime, authority resides with the regime and they're prepared to prosecute their authority in in a number of ways but generally just short of the at in inverted commas at more not inverted commas but it's because it's a phrase at the pain of death um, so regimes um, regimes that are hardline and and relatively brutal in that they will they will jail their people they they um, well the best case in our region I, I can think of is Singapore which um, is is notionally democratic but but there's it's essentially been a one-party state uh, for a long time um, um, where there are uh, a relative freedoms we you go to Singapore and it looks like it looks like a free democratic capitalist society but it's a society that's run uh, by a very strong leader um, and traditional too in that that you have a procession of power from from Lee Kuan Yew who was the sort of the father um, through to and and power was sort of passed passed through to the next generation um, um, the authoritarian regime is is determined to, to keep control while while the population is conforming to their expectations um, and their rule things are okay when they're not then um, steps are taken to to curtail that and reasonably hardline steps so you may um, you may be subject to well um, their their drug regime is is brutal and, and unforgiving and and we've seen um, a number of Australians um, subject to the death penalty for um, um, for breaking their, their drug laws you you may be caned um, so authoritarian regimes um, some of the Arab states would also be seen as, as authoritarian regimes and authoritarianism has a resonance <laughs> with some of us as well where you you will see um, you know the banal argument that, that um, Hitler made the trains run on time you know um, and and you get this idea that, that the authoritarian leader brooks no uh, no interference in the expression of their their mandate and you get in Australia you get authoritarian leaders leaders who are belligerent and who are strong and who will brook no no resistance um, in in recent times I think Jeff Kennett is probably the best example of an authoritarian leader in a democratic setting um, so and and there are parts of us that as I was saying respond to this democratic uh, this this authoritarian response and it was and and um, that reference to to pre-war Germany is 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 one of those things that that um, uh, gets referred to in terms of authoritarian regime and the well, the point people are, are trying to make when they use that that very bad um, uh, comparison between uh, what was what ended up being a totalitarian uh, regime one of the more brutal regimes in the world because 
despite the fact that six million were killed by Hitler, Stalin um, uh, and Lenin killed millions as well, and Mao Zedong in, in China killed millions, millions as well. Um, despite that, what, what they're getting at in the authoritarian thing is they can make things happen. And in, in a political environment like ours, where there seems to be so much negotiation and toing and froing between government and opposition, um, and things don't get done, we have a lurking admiration for the authoritarian. Anyway, um, you then have the, the, the monarchical system where you have a family that, that, that has power, has had power down through the ages, and I think that's pretty straightforward, and we talked about that in traditional. And then you have the dem democratic forms of, of power, and that's, that's notionally where the people, the people hold the power. Um, all democratic regimes... Um, oh, got to be very careful saying all. Um, democratic governments uh, generally are representative democracies. Uh, I think um, California tried direct democracy for a little while, and I'll explain the difference shortly, but generally they're, uh, they're representative democracies. So that the people's power doesn't really reside in the people. The people's power resides in the representative that you elect. So when you all go off, um, you may be going off sooner rather than... Uh, We'll see what happens with Gillard and Rudd. Um, the talk is that if Rudd gets in, he may go to a quick election. If he doesn't get in, he may quit, and then we go to an election anyway. When you go to the next election, or for you Queenslanders, when you go to elections, well, you probably, well, no. <laughs> You've been to the elections, haven't you, on March 24th. Um, what you're doing is you're electing a person to represent your views in Parliament. So that democratic process is called, in fact, representative democracy, where you elect your member and your member goes off and gives expression to your views. The problem with that and the thing that modifies that is that you're actually electing, generally, um, electing a member of a political party. And what happens is they give expression to the views of the party, not necessarily the views of the electorate. So in fact, what you're in most cases in Australia doing is asking a party to represent your views or in fact, you're giving a party, a political party, permission to run their agenda. You're not actually having the representative you elect do your bidding. And you know, um, I th we were talking about a couple of weeks ago or well, last week with the family. Family was the last one, was it, David? I think so. The last one, but one, yeah, education was, was last week. In the family, when we were talking about uh, gay marriage, um, we understand uh, through the polls that the majority of Australians are happy for gay marriage to, to be legislated in Australia. Our politicians won't do it. Our political parties appear not to. And again, things may change between now and then. Um, our political parties, despite the fact that it's, it's now a, a, a part of Labor Party policy, um, it doesn't seem like the Labor P Party, as the government, will vote for it. The opposition certainly aren't going to vote for it. So in terms of the government representing our views uh, and the opposition when, when they're together in the parliament, um, representing our views, that doesn't happen. Uh, euthanasia, I suppose, is another um, classic example where you would say that um, uh, the majority of Australians, um, a smaller majority in this case, I think, um, uh, want the right to die, uh, but our politicians won't do that because... And, and so when we're talking about politics, what we've got to understand is that, that political parties are, are strategic. They're instrumental in how they, they give voice to, to their policies. And, and what's guiding them is not the interests of the population. What's guiding them are their own interests because they're concerned with getting re-elected. And if they know that they have, there are key uh, electorates, uh, constituencies throughout Australia that will, will swing one way or the other, their policies are going to be targeted at those people. This is one of those things that, that 
we heard well a lot in in the Howard era um, and a little bit now but not not so much anymore the notion of dog whistling where you send out a message without actually saying you agree with it so when Pauline Hanson came uh, was elected in 1996 and started ranting about Asian immigration and and um, the indigenous people of Australia uh, what happened was um, Howard didn't resist, didn't come out strongly against it and repudiate it, um, uh, said things like, well, it's, it's probably good, it's, it's in, a, in an open society, it's good to have a debate. So the idea is that, that you dog whistle a message saying, well, I actually think it's okay. And you send those messages out to particular electorates um, where you think that that message has resonance and may work in your favour. So, so the expression of politics, um, although we, 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 it's built on a democratic system where we expect the voice of the people to be, to be given vent through, through the parliament, it's actually more to do with the, the voice of the, the political parties being given vent and then the strategic understanding that the parties have about what's in their best interests. In certain issues, there are there are broader issues where um, the interests of uh, the direct interests of the people are uh, taken in hand. And part, part one of the other arguments is that the, the politics needs to lead rather than follow. So sometimes the electorate needs to be taken to to an issue. And um, at the moment, Gillard would argue that the carbon tax is one of those that that we are taking people to. Howard did the same thing with the GST, where where he took the people who who were resistant to to a point where they they accepted it and and probably would now vote for it again. So the democratic system is 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 a little more complex uh, and less straightforward than simply the people uh, having power. But the notion is that that the people's voice is given expression through through a parliament. That's essentially how, uh, how the notion of politics runs. Now. Um, there's, there's, along with, with everything else in our lives, there's a globalised form of politics that, that we're dealing with now. Um, that um, what happens in, in politically in other parts of the world affects us and affects all other parts of the world, if you get my meaning. Um, and the, the prime example at the moment is, is what's happening with Europe as a result of the GFC and the, the difficulties, with, difficulties with Greece, Ireland, Spain, Portugal. Um, Greece, Ireland, Spain, Portugal, what's the other? Italy. Italy. Um, now, what's happening there manifestly is in, in their political, the, um, it's a financial problem, it's an economic problem, and the solution has to be found politically. Um, the solutions that are, well, the manifestations of the GFC are being felt around the world. The political responses to that are also being felt around the world. Um, and then we have to have consequent political responses to that to that as well. So the globalisation of politics means that we we've become much more aware, but much more uh, reliant on what happens in in other parts of the world. And if you think the decisions that, that China make about the level of their yuan, how how they value their currency, and the argument at the moment is that they va they're valuing their currency low. Um, so that the, their goods are much cheaper, so, so they're, they're able to sell more goods. Um, our dollar is, is higher because of our coal exports and um, our inflationary situation. We're dragging money, uh, money in because our, our interest rates are, are high, generally higher than the rest of the world. Um, the dynamics of, and, and these are all affected by political decisions. Um, these aren't simply the market working, there are political decisions that are going on. Say if the government, our government, put in that super mining tax, that would have maybe cut back production a little bit, um, moderated the effect of the dollar, maybe increased inflation slightly, and there'd be a different economic dynamic that's affected by politics and then that would have been felt around the world. So what we've got to understand is that the politics is no longer isolated uh, to the, the borders of a particular country, state or municipality. They all bleed out into each other across the world. Now what I've also included in this lecture, because the lecture's been based on your textbook, um, 
but I thought for um, for some of you, um, because I teach I teach a subject in third year called public policy, where I I look at the Australian political system in detail and just break down how the the houses work, the relationship between the the upper house and the lower house in all of the states except Queensland, which only has one house. Uh, I've added that um, um, that document uh, that looks at Australian Australian politics and how it works in with the learning materials. So have a look at that and you can talk that through with, with, with your tutors. Um, I assume most of you will understand but I'm, mm, I'm always surprised the extent to which people don't, don't quite get it because I always get students coming up at the end of that third year lecture and they go, oh, I've, been re I've re really wanted to know exactly how the Australian political system works, you know, the relationship between the High Court and the the Parliament and all of that sort of stuff. So that's explained in that extra document. So, so have a through, read through that as well. And I'll see you next week for lecture ten. Bye for now. This has been a Swinburne production.